All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ching Li, and today I'm going to talk about the diffusion models for medical anomaly detection. And this is the paper that was done by the University of Basel, a uh, whole bunch of faculty from the biomedical engineering department. And diffusion model has been shown a uh, very potential, a lot of potential in the generic, gener uh, general, oh, excuse me. The, in, in the general uh, computer vision community, it is a pretty good at synthesizers. And because of that, so the people in the medical images feel saying that, okay, if this is model is great. So maybe we can try to adapt those models uh, from, not, from not just uh, using in the general computer vision uh, application, but also used for the medical anomaly detection. And this, this is the first medical anomaly detection algorithm in the world. So what is the medical anomaly detection? So basically the idea is if we given uh, images to, with the anomalization region, like this one, which is the tumor of the brain MRI, then we should be able to detect it where is the anomalization part. It can be either segmented or use some other methods. And then, so why we need to solve this problem? So this is because the um, the second generation result is the piece of ground truth and the piece of ground truth is really hard to obtain because it also requires a lot of the people that has the professional knowledge like doctors to do the labeling. And because the doctors are doing the labeling, so they also have the human biases in the, in the data set if you want to do the labeling, uh, which might also affect our training result in the future. So some of the related words include the autoencoders and the GAN. So for the autoencoders, it's been used for pretty a pretty long time, but the quality is not great and the details are lost. So here's the uh, result from an autoencoder. As we can see that uh, the generated result has a fuzzy edges and there are some white dots that all are all in the generation results. And another approach is using the GAN. This is this gun is actually pretty good at this task, but the 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 weakness of the gun is it is really hard to train. It requires a lot of turning, and you might also have some issue that are causing the training to crashes during the during the procedure of the trainings. And another another thing that the diffusion is better than the gun is the gun has a pretty limited resolution. And diffusion has already shows that it is capable to generate a really large and high resolution uh, images with pretty good fidelity and quality. So here is the result that was produced by a GAN paper. So as you can see that uh, this is the anomalization part. Um, it is really doing a pretty good job, although we can still see some of the other uh, organisms of the bodies, but this is a highlight of uh, anomalization part pretty well. Okay, so the motivation of this paper, it is because the diffusion has shown better quality result in the generic, uh, um, in gen generic computer vision field. It has been using for a lot of famous models like DALI E, um, um, DALI E2, and stable diffusion to generate, a, to generate some of the uh, modern arts or some other paintings. Another reason is diffusion is pretty easy to train, which this is why they want to use the diffusion to replace the GAN. And then the diffusion learns the semantic information better because it was this latent space. So in other words, uh, if we use the diffusion model, um, it can learn the anatomic information that is obtained in the training data that is better than the GAN. So here is the uh, generation result of the diffusion models. So as you can see that uh, I purposely chose those images with the animals that has a lot of furs and mustache because usually in the generation task, these are the pretty difficult parts to generate it. As you can see that it not only uh, has the pretty high fidelity, it is also has a pretty good quality. And the re resolution of those images, I believe is a 1024 times 1024, which is pretty high resolution. And we can even make it uh, even more higher. So the contribution of this paper is, this is the first one to use the diffusion model for abnormal detection. And then uh, not because of that, they also achieved the state of the other results. And in this paper, it also proposed a new way to find the abnormation math. 
So the framework, so I want to introduce this uh, framework from a pretty upper level um, perspective first, and then we are going to talk about the detail. So at the beginning, we are going to give it the um, abnormation images. In this example, it is a brain tumor to the neural network, to the model. And then we slightly adding the noise, which is a part of the diffusion model that I'm going to talk about later. And now we encode these images with the noises, uh, which is a Gaussian. And then we gradually remove the noise to form the output, which is the healthy brain MRI instead of the input, it is the abnormal images. And then the last step that we subtract the output with the input to form the anomalization map. Awesome. So I'm going to talk about what is the diffusion model. So diffusion model is a four, is a is a Markov procedure that involves the two uh, two steps. The first step is the forward step. Um, in the image, is called a forward diffusion. So um, it is a given the previous step to try to approximate what is the next uh, images looks like with the noise. So we kind of like approximating the noises and the images gradually from the original images toward the x big t. And in our case, the x big t will just be the standard Gaussian noise images. And then in the reverse diffusion from the back, uh, we are going to do the backward procedure and starting from the XT, the normal Gaussian distribution, that we gradually remove the noise to try to reconstruct the X0, which is our original images. Okay, so let's take a look on how it looks like. So at first we give it the images and then we gradually adding the noise by conditional probability. And this is the procedure in the X little t. And then now eventually that we ending up with the normal Gaussian distribution. And this is the forward step. And now we are doing the backward step from the normal distributed Gaussian noises that we gradually remove the noise to form X zero. And this is parameterized by the P theta. And P theta is the part that we are going to uh, learn by the neural, by our, our neural, neural network. All right, then I'm going to talk about the detail of the procedure. So from the X0 to X1 to X2 and to X3, so given the X0 and then uh, we want to predict the X1. So I want to talk about what are the variables. The first variable is called beta, which is the variance schedule. It is control the variance of the Gaussian noise during the during those procedures, especially the full procedure. And then the alpha t and alpha t bar is just some variables that was based on the uh, beta, which is just kind of like adaptation of the variance schedule. So in the forward procedure, um, this is the how we approximate the in the uh, the next images, and then it is approximated by the Gaussian uh, form. And then we can write it as explicit form, which means that we can um, directly writing down what is the XT is instead of trying to go through the um, those the formal procedure iteratively and step by step. And the eta is just going to be the noise. And then the reverse procedure. So in the reverse procedure, we are trying to parameterize the XT given, and then to produce the what is the X that T minus one, which is the previous images. And this is can also written in a Gaussian form that the mu theta represent the mean of the Gaussian and then the sigma theta representing the uh, variance of the theta. But we want to uh, approximate what is the mean part instead of the sigma part because it is controlled by the var uh, variance schedule already. All right, then just want to let you know that this is the learning parameters. Please remember that. All right, then. so here is how we um, find the loss and how to train the models. So given the proper procedure and the bevel procedures, and now we want to use the Bayes to rewrite the procedures, and then we minimize the KL divergence, which means that we try to approximate what is the difference between the, uh, the, the distribution between those two formulas, which means that we are trying to uh, use the KL divergence 
to finding out what is the best match of the approximated distribution of the of the data. And then the loss function in the training. So this is the, our final loss function, like I, made, I, I explained before, that we are trying to minimize the difference between the noises, which is the noises is, is controlling by the uh, Gaussians. And then um, this is training by using a unit because we are dealing with the same image size, which is a pretty uh, good fit for the unit. And then the unit is just going to produce, uh, is going to predict whether the noise that we want to remove and we graduate the removing in the formal, in the backward procedures. All right, so for the inference, I want to talk about the two formulas first. So this the first one is the backward. This is a, this is a not the same as the bevel procedure that I mentioned because that was the training procedure. Now it's the inference procedure. So as you can see that the uh, the, 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 the sigma t is equal to zero. This is because um, it, we don't want to we don't want to have the stochastic result in our final output. So by changing the sigma t to a zero, that we the the generated result will be deterministic. Uh, not just the generated result, all everything in the procedure is going to be deterministic. And then now we have the forward procedures. It is basically using the train date model to inference date. So I also want to talk about the classifier guidance. So this is another way to write the diffusion model. And this is the classifier term. And this is the unconditional diffusion model. So unconditional diffusion model just means that we train the diffusion model without any additional information to uh, guiding it. So what is the guidance doing? So in the guidance that we have a hyperparameter S, we're going to use in the algorithm later. It is telling the models that what is the condition that you want to generate and how important it is. As we can see that if the S is one, we still got some mouses, but when the S is 10, it's trying to emphasize that the mouse is very important. And therefore in the images, uh, it, they don't have a lot of other objects compared with the S equals to one. So I'm going to talk about the algorithm first. Uh, this is the inference algorithms because we train the, the, uh, the diffusion model and the classifier separately. So this is just the inference procedure. So as I mentioned before, we have the forward procedures. We're gradually adding the noise to the XT. And then now we are going to gradually remove the noises. So it's kind of like we have the S here, which is controlling the con conditional uh, generation right here. And then now we have the new eta head and then just using to substitute the eta the, the epsilon theta with the epsilon head to the form. This is the, the backward procedure that removes the noise. And then now eventually that we are going to subtracting the output and the original images to output what is the optimization map. All right, guys, end for the math part. So I'm going to talk about the construction quality because if we can, uh, if we, we can construct the images pretty well, that means that uh, the model can have a better result for generating the optimal motion path. So this is the generation result of the healthy image input. So as you can see that um, in this abnormally map, it basically has nothing, which means that we have a generating pretty good result that has basically no difference compared with the generating images. Uh, sorry, compare with the original images. And then uh, after test the models with other um, previous uh, methods with the checks per, checks per data set. The checks per data set is just the X-ray of the human upper body. So this is the, this is the model that we can see that this is the anomalous part. And compared with the DTPN, well, it has a lot of other uh, not relevant parts in there, and it didn't even uh, de detect the anomaly parts. And for the FP gun, mm, this is not good as well. And I mean, it's a little bit better. It's, at least it's trying something. And then the VAE, the, this one probably is the worst. Basically, means that it's just very different for the final result. And this. And then I'm also going to talk about the Brats of 2020, which is the brain MRI. So as you can see that um, in the in our models that we have pretty good result right here, 
we have the anomaly regions pretty well. And then the other regions, they are all, all kind of like transparent. And then we compare with the DDPN one, this one does not do pretty well because it has a lot of the highlighting for the edges, which is not the anomaly part at, at all. And then we, we have the HP gun. This one seems to doing a little bit better compared with the other previous methods. And, but it's still not mm, still not really good compared with ours because look look at the method that is proposed in the paper there he said it is pretty close to the original uh, ground truth but the FP gun um, it is not that good and then the last one the VAE yeah it's not it's not great it's it it it, it, it has even has this um, triangle shape right here that probably is the worst. And then I'm going to talk about the parameter evaluation because we have the L parameter, which is the noises, no, uh, how many steps that we want to do for adding the noise. And another parameter is the gradient, gradient scale, which is the S that controlling the conditional generation. So for the dice score, it evaluates the, how good the quality of the generated results. So we can see that uh, this probably is the best, best result. And then the OROC, the OROC score is measuring how good the classifier it is. And because the, our model is, is highly dependent on the classifier quality, so doing the ORC is very important since this is also a, a conditional generation. And then we are going to discuss the, the how those uh, gradient parameters affecting, affecting our models. So in this slide, the, we, have the, we have the gradient parameter S, which is controlling the conditional probability. And then we fix the we fix the L parameters. So we can see that if it is a two small, then the two more did not remove at all. Right? Look at that. It is still right there. And then we gradually increasing it. And we look at the last one. So it has a generating the artifacts, especially on the edges. Look at all of these parts right here and here. And then this one, I'm going to talk about the noise level parameter L. Um, as we can see that if the L is pretty low, then it has a lot of noises here. And then if we, the L is too large, it just includes everything. So basic, and if we look at the generated result here, it almost destroyed the whole images. So this is just kind of not a very good result for, the, uh, for those parameters. So in other words, the fine tuning the parameters for our model is quite important. So the conclusion of this paper, it has proposed a pretty normal approach for abnormal detection because it integrates the state of the art models from the gener general computer vision fields. And it also uh, uses the classifier and diffusion model to train it separately because um, because they probably don't have the enough computation power to do the classifier free guidance. And then the other one is they have used generated health images by diffusion model, which is pretty good that we can reconstruct it, reconstruct it from it. And then uh, the result reaches the state of the R, of course, I've mentioned it multiple times already. That's why this paper is good. And then uh, the approximation approach is really task that works to explore because um, we have we can use this model for other modality, right? And like not just the MRI, but also for other modality like um, CT scan or something else. And then the strength and the weakness. So I think the strength is the most important strength is the data do not require labeling, and that is a very important because the labeling for the medical images data requires a lot of uh, a lot of work because the pixel. Why is labeling? It's hard. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is not everyone can do labeling. It has to be people with the professional knowledge, like a doctor. And those people are pretty busy and hard to find to do this work. And then the second thread is to improve the anomaly detection performance because it, well, it just achieved the, achieved the state of the R result, as we can show on those previous uh, experimental results. And I think that another strength is the resolution robustic. It's because um, if we train in the previous model, like the CNNs, uh, they have the pretty fixed uh, resolution requirement and it's limited. But for the differential model, uh, no matter what the resolution it is, they can handle it pretty well. Now, the weakness for this model, I think, is the classifier quality is pretty pretty important because if, with the, if we didn't train classifier well, 
And it is really hard to say to actually tell in the model what it wants to generate, and the training result probably is going to not going to be really good. Another another is like the weakness for almost every diffusion model. This is a long time to generate. Is due to the its the iteration iteration procedure. Um, some of the other diffusion models probably don't need a forward procedure during the inference, but even if you don't need a focal procedure, you, you still need the backward procedure to do the inferencing. And then the, uh, the iteration step is just going to cost a lot of time as the uh, noise step increases. So my rating is four over five, because this is a pretty creative, uh, pretty creative uh, article and the result is good. And we can use it for other adaptation later. And so it's basically telling the whole medical images, if you say, hey, this is our new approach, then maybe you can do some, with something else. I think it has a pretty good um, application in the real world because it can save a lot of their human work and saving the time for doing the data labeling. And then it is also very important for anomaly detection because um, in some countries that they probably don't have uh, those a lot of doctor that is trained well. So maybe we can use those to help the patients. So my future idea will just be um, trying the model with some of the other medical images and modality like a CT scan or the sonic sounds because those are the two some of the uh, images and modality that we can use. And another one is trying to optimize the computation speed. Although the asset uses some um, techniques like the DDIM reversion, but I'm, I'm not sure if we can uh, train the model a little bit better by using uh, the DDIM to skip some of the uh, steps because that's one of the feature of the DDIM model. And then another one is training the model with the classifier free guidance, of course, because this is like the um, latest, uh, latest technique to train the model when we try to do the conditional generation. But the only concern is we probably don't have that much uh, computation resource but since the medical images data set usually are pretty small, so I think this is going to be doable. And that's all for my presentation. And thank you guys for listening.